millions of people have lost weight with personalized plans from Noom, like Evan, who can't stand salads and still lost 50 pounds. Salads generally for most people are the easy button, right? For me, that wasn't an option. I never really was a salad guy. That's just not who I am. But Noom worked for me. Get your personalized plan today at Noom.com. Real Noom user compensated to provide their story. In four weeks, the typical Noom user can expect to lose one to two pounds per week. Individual results may vary. Millions of people have lost weight with personalized plans from Noom. Like Evan, who can't stand salads and still lost 50 pounds. Salads generally for most people are the easy button, right? For me, that wasn't an option. I never really was a salad guy. That's just not who I am. But Noom worked for me. Get your personalized plan today at Noom.com. Real Noom user compensated to provide their story. In four weeks, the typical Noom user can expect to lose one to two pounds per week. Individual results may vary. Michael Jordan was arguably the best basketball player that has ever lived. But before all the shots he took and the championships he earned, his mom, Dolores Jordan, she changed the money game for Michael and so many other athletes that would follow. While Michael Jordan's bank account, it might be a little bit bigger than yours and mine, there are definitely a few money lessons that you can learn from Dolores Jordan. Welcome to Everyone's Talking Money Podcast. I'm your host, Shauna Game. There's no judgment, no dumb questions, just smart conversations about you and your money. So come on in and grab a seat. Everyone is welcome here. Welcome back to this fun Friday episode. You know, I just recently saw the movie Air. I don't know if you have seen it yet, but It was such a great movie. I love movies like this. Like any movie that is about somebody's actual story or historical, I don't know, I just really geek out over them because I don't know, I I love that like human aspect and I love learning about what makes people great, what makes them tick and also I guess what kind of makes people fall apart. But The movie era was all about Michael Jordan's legendary signing deal with Nike for a just absolutely never before seen shoe deal. And it's said in the movie, I don't know how exactly accurate this was, but after the end of the movie, it said that Michael Jordan earns somewhere around $400 million a year in passive income from that deal which I know that's that's crazy that's crazy money just to think that that is just the passive income amount but we're going to talk more about that in just a little bit Michael Jordan if you don't know he was not drafted number 1 in the NBA in 1984 when he came in he was actually drafted number 3 which might be a little bit surprising I think NBA teams they knew that he was going to be a really good basketball player But they just weren't too sure, like, was he going to be that great? Or was he just going to be, you know, one of those other players that kind of came out of college and they played in the NBA for a little bit, but then they just kind of faded away. And of course, you actually know how the story goes, even if you aren't a basketball fan. You've most definitely heard the name Michael Jordan. You've seen the commercials. You've seen the shoes. I mean, it's just, it's it's kind of a massive empire. And, you know, he hasn't played basketball in in quite a few years, but it's still the sort of legend and the mystique of Michael Jordan carries on. He's got some very impressive stats. He played for about 15 seasons. He averaged about 30 points. He kind of won every single award there was to win in the NBA. He played in six NBA championships, six finals MVP. And he was inducted into the Hall of Fame in 2009. So, you know, to say that his career was impressive is is definitely an understatement. He's definitely the GOAT, I would say, in, in basketball. Of course, you could argue lots of other people and, you know, new people come along like LeBron James and Kobe Bryant. And, you know, there's always these names. But Michael Jordan is always kind of be, I think, kind of this pinnacle peak of basketball players. 
And, you know, I, I was so excited to do this episode after I watched the movie because I really love basketball. I don't know about you. I don't know if you're a sports fan, but I was that girl when I was little who would watch uh, basketball with my dad. We lived in Los Angeles and were huge fans of Los Angeles Lakers. Sorry for any Celtics uh, or any other fans. Really, I am a diehard Los Angeles Laker fan, no matter where I live. But my dad worked a lot. He worked five days a week, of course, and usually worked Saturdays too. So basketball became this kind of ritual that we would have together. Even my brother wasn't really into basketball, but I would sit down with my dad and you know, I, I didn't know at that time when I was young, but I love stats. I love math. I love, I don't know, strategy and kind of I, what I like about basketball is to me, it's like putting together puzzle pieces, right? So what are the right players that go together? What are the right shots? Just all of that is really fascinating to me. I think that's why when I got onto finance and financial planning. I really loved it because when I'm working with people and their money, it's it is it's like putting this giant puzzle together and it's just super fun for me. So, I, you know, there's just something about basketball that I just I loved. I love that it's fast paced and that your team could be down all the way till almost the end of the game and then you know, suddenly like just something changes and the score changes and there's, you know, those like buzzer beater shots. I mean, it just, I don't know. I, I, I still love it. And, you know, when I was watching basketball when I was young, I mean, it was undeniable that Michael Jordan was absolutely amazing. And I actually never got to see him in a live NBA game. That's kind of one of my one of my big regrets that I never actually, you know, got got to do that. But I was at some really impressive um, Laker games. I mean, two certainly epic games. I was at Los Angeles game on April 29th, 1992, when the riots in Los Angeles broke out. And we were actually being kept inside the forum where the Lakers play because the riots started in Inglewood, kind of right around the forum where the Lakers play. And it was crazy. We didn't know what was going on outside. You know, it was 92. We didn't, we didn't have cell phones like we do now. So we were kind of clueless as to what was going on. And I was there at the game with my dad. And, you know, when we were, we were leaving, like everybody had to leave one specific way and the cars had to leave one specific way. And I just remember seeing fires and things burning and just, you know, all sorts of really scary things as a kid. And I mean, it just, I don't know, that obviously won't really stick in my brain. And then the other game I saw in 1991, so a year previous, and that was the game just before Magic Johnson announced that he was HIV positive. And I remember my dad uh, was, was kind of I don't know, yelling, if that, I don't know, how, how you say taunting, yelling, I don't know, whatever, at Magic, like, hey, you need to, you know, pick up your game, like you're not playing well. And he was like really disappointed. And then of course, literally like the next day, Magic made the announcement that he was HIV positive. And, you know, of course you feel really bad about that. But I was at these these two like really big, impactful historical uh, games. And I, so for me, I just, I love basketball and um I just, I love the feeling too of like everybody in an arena kind of cheering for something. And it's just about fun and entertainment and kind of a collective group of people. And I always sort of feel like when you're in, you know, a sporting event or a concert or whatever it might be, it's just this great time to be really present and to not have to worry about money or career or I don't know, things you have to do in life, right? It's just about like being in that moment. So I think that's what I really love about basketball. So back to Michael Jordan, you know, prior to the NBA, Michael's family was just a working class family that lived in Wilmington, North Carolina. But his mom, Dolores, really saw something in Michael and she believes that 
you know, he's going to stand in this league of his own. He is going to be legendary. It's like she had a crystal ball <laughs> and she could see what was going to happen. And I, I just, I'm thinking we all should have a mom like that, right? That just believes so intently in us, no matter what it is that we want to do. She was really sharp. And, you know, Michael really credits her for being just a mom who was not afraid to kind of buck the system and demand more, demand more for her son. And obviously that was going to sort of change the whole trajectory of, of the family. So before Michael, no one had a shoe deal like Michael got. It just, it didn't exist. So the movie kind of chronicles this whole, you know, time period when Michael was actually looking at at shoe companies that he was going to sign with, there were three options, Converse. And that was the brand that kind of all the other athletes like Magic Johnson, Larry Bird, they all wore Converse. So it was there wasn't anything unique or special about it, right? And then you had Adidas. And Adidas was really popular at the time. Everybody was wearing those track suits. And Adidas was the... Um, the brand, the shoe brand that Michael was really interested in. Of course, it was a little bit hipper, a little bit fresher, and he was just sort of dead set on, I'm going to sign with Adidas. I'm going to sign with Adidas. So it was really interesting in the movie. I don't know exactly how accurate this is. I have read some articles kind of prepping for this episode that said, you know, it was it was fairly accurate. But Adidas was saying that they were going to offer Michael the most amount of money and more money than they had offered really any other, um, you know, athlete, basketball star. And so, of course, that's attractive, right? The money piece is always going to be super attractive. And at that time when Michael was coming out of college and into the NBA, no one really knew at that time how just kind of you know, crazy, successful, amazing, out of this world uh, Michael Jordan was going to be, but they had a hunch that there was something very, very unique about him, right? So he was just dead set on that he wanted to sign with Adidas. But, you know, in all of these meetings where the family went to talk to Converse and Adidas and then Nike, with Converse and Adidas, he was just going to be another athlete with another shoe line. And he was just going to be part of the Converse family or part of the Adidas family, right? But Dolores had this idea that he could be something different, that he could really sort of revolutionize, you know, this whole business of, of being a brand and of having your own, I guess, you know, shoe line. And it wasn't that they had this line in the movie that, you know, it wasn't that Michael Jordan was going to wear whatever shoe, right? It was more like that shoe was going to represent everything that Michael Jordan was. So also really interesting at that time, Nike wasn't the Nike that we know today before this deal happened. In fact, they were thinking about closing down their basketball division so in a, a Wikipedia article that, that talks about this whole story, it says that in 1984, Oregon-based Nike was on the verge of shutting down their basketball shoe division due to low sales. In response to this, their marketing VP, Rob Strasser, along with co-founder and CEO Phil Knight, tasked Nike's basketball talent scout, Sonny Vaccaro, to come up with this new spokesperson for Nike basketball shoes. And so... Sonny was out there, you know, trying to be, uh, you know, kind of on the cutting edge, right? Like find who is going to be that next player. And while considering the basketball players to choose in the 1984 draft, Nike executives, uh, they really think that the third pick, Michael Jordan, is kind of off limits, right? He's a fan of Adidas and he's also too expensive. Like there isn't going to be a way they're going to be able to afford him. But once Sonny actually watches Jordan's highlights in conjunction with a commercial that comes on the air for Arthur Ashe, who was another legendary uh, tennis player at the time, he had his own brand of tennis rackets, of head tennis rackets. 
Sonny became convinced that, you know, Nike could actually pursue uh, Michael Jordan, that he was this generational talent, both as a brand and as an athlete, and that, you know, together with Nike, they could both kind of build their brands, right? And in this pursuit of uh, making a lot of money, obviously, and um, uh, working together to do something that, you know, had, had never been really done before. And so Sonny saw something in Michael, he watched this video and, you know, Michael was relaxed on the court in his playing. You know, he was he was kind of this easygoing guy, but he also knew that he could make the big shots. Like way back then, he knew, like, give me the ball, give me the ball, like I can make those shots. And so Sonny thought, like, maybe, just maybe, that would continue when Michael got to the NBA. And maybe, just maybe, just maybe, Michael could become super legendary and would put Nike on the map. Financial anxiety, anyone? Yeah, you're not alone. But worrying about it, it doesn't help. Earnin does. Earnin is an app that gives you access to your pay as you work up to $100 per day or up to $750 per pay period. You just download the Earnin app and verify your paycheck. Then you can access up to $100 per day as you work and leave an additional tip. Any money you access plus tips are automatically repaid from your next paycheck. So how would you spend the money you get from Earnin? Well, honestly, my hubby and I have been feeling a little bit disconnected lately. That's what happens after you've been together about 12 years. So I would spend the money on a special date night with dinner and maybe bowling, you know, to bring back some of that giggly excitement that we both felt at the beginning. Make Earnin a part of your financial routine and join Earnin's over three and a half million customers who say things like, when I think about Earnin, I think about financial stability, security, gives me a lot of peace of mind. Download Earnin today, spelled E-A-R-N-I-N, in the Google Play or Apple App Store. When you download the Earnin app, type in Talkin, T-A-L-K-A-N, money under podcast when you sign up. It will really help the show. Talkin money under podcast. Subject to your available earnings, location, daily max, and pay period max. See earnin.com slash TOS for details. Earnin is a financial technology company, not a bank. Bank products are issued by Evolve Bank & Trust, member FDIC. When it comes to financial advice, you got to trust the source. It's why you listen to this podcast. When I'm looking to upgrade my wallet, I turn to NerdWallet. Their expert team of nerds dives into the details to help you find smarter financial products. Before NerdWallet, I was paying for vacations all wrong. <laughs> I was missing out on miles. I didn't even know I was leaving on the table. Now I've got a new card with more miles and more upgrades. What could future you do with more travel rewards? I don't know, maybe that fancy hotel upgrade that you have always been dreaming about. Wherever you go next, make it happen with a smarter travel credit card. Don't wait to make smart financial decisions. Compare and find smarter credit cards, savings accounts, and more today at nerdwallet.com. Nerdwallet. Finance smarter. As with all cards, credit is subject to lender approval and terms apply. Listen, if you've been using Mint to manage your money, I have got some news for you. First, the bad news. As you might know, Mint is shutting down for good. But the good news, well, there is a way better alternative that is a personal favorite of mine, Monarch Money. And I'm not the only lover of Monarch Money. Many Mint users are turning to Monarch Money and just raving about it. I used to manage my money with an Excel spreadsheet. I know, so archaic. And it was so time consuming. I tried all of the apps but I just didn't find one I liked until I found Monarch. And I've got to tell you a secret. Monarch is so easy to use with a very intuitive design. You can even collaborate with your partner and you can customize Monarch for whatever your needs are. Monarch is the top rated all-in-one personal finance app. It gives you a comprehensive view of all your accounts, investments, transactions, and more. Create custom budgets, set goals, and collaborate with your partner. And now get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com etm. Let's go back to the collaboration bit. Because we know money is a leading cause of divorce and breakups, Monarch has built in collaboration features so you can invite your partner at no extra cost. You can see all your finances, make a budget together, get insights on your cash. Yes, cue the confetti. There will literally not be any more arguments over money. And if you've been frustrated with personal finance apps that are cluttered with ads, difficult to use, or rarely updated, so was Monarch. They built a new kind of personal finance app that's intuitive and powerful. 
ad-free and constantly improving based on customer feedback. Monarch has a tool that allows you as well to easily import your data from Mint. You can keep all of your tags and all of your categories. After trying Monarch for myself, I understand why it's the top-rated personal finance app. And right now, get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com slash etm. That's M-O-N-A-R-C-H-M-O-N-E-Y dot com slash etm for your extended 30-day free trial. So back to Dolores, right? She knew that when making the deal with Nike, she wanted something more than just money. And I don't know if this was her idea. I don't know if this was her husband's idea. I don't know if this was Michael's idea. I don't know if this was collectively all their ideas. But at least in the movie and from the articles I've read, Dolores was really the spearhead of believing that there was something different out there. So she wanted Michael to earn a percentage, a piece of the action from every single shoe that was sold. Now, this had never, ever been done before, a kind of deal like this. And in fact, when she presents it in the movie on the phone to to Sonny at Nike, he was like, no, 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 like, this is, we can't do this. This is, they're never going to go for this, the board. It's just not going to work. And Dolores kind of, (laughs) you know, goes back and forth and is like, well, you know, this is, this is what we want. And this is what we're going to settle for. So you take it back to Nike and, you know, you you let me know, right? So there's a scene where Sonny goes into Phil Knight, the CEO of Nike, and, you know, there's kind of like this hesitation and Phil's like, oh, I don't know, I don't know. And then he's like, all right, look, let's do it. Like, let's do the deal. I mean, how many shoes <laughs> can Michael Jordan actually sell? right? So I guess the the joke's kind of on everybody in this this scenario. So according to an article uh, on Afrotech, it says that for fiscal 2022, just 2022, Nike's Jordan brand raked in about $5.1 billion. On the other end, Jordan is said to have earned an estimated $256.1 million in just 2022. (laughs) The outlet also noted that the Jordan brand earned about $19.4 billion in revenue over the last five fiscal years. So that is the five previous years to which Michael Jordan did not play basketball. So if that is any indication to you, (laughs) he's made a ton of money off this deal with Nike. More money, in fact, than he ever made playing basketball. And that was what his mom saw. That is what she sort of foreshadowed was that if Michael could really embody the shoe, embody this brand, right? So when you saw the Nike shoe, you saw Michael Jordan. When you put that shoe on your feet and you went out, you felt like you were Michael Jordan, that you were the greatness that he is, right? It become so ingrained in the shoe that when you're wearing the Air Jordans, you feel like Michael, right? And then you're also turning on the TV and you're watching him play in the games and he's wearing the shoes that you're wearing. And it's almost like you felt this magic in this shoe, right? It's a very interesting kind of scenario that she thought would would happen. Now, that's a lot of money. That's a ton of money, obviously, that he's earned. But it would have never happened, right, if his mom did not step out and demand something more and kind of push against the rules and the regime that had been set up to that point. So I think there's actually a lot that you can learn from Dolores. Most importantly, I think the money lesson is that, you know, when you value your worth, When you know that you are worth something, I don't care what your skill set is, we all have a skill set that is unique to us, right? When, When you know that, and also when you feel the permission to break the rules, magic can happen. Now, I'm not talking about doing anything illegal here, right? What I mean is when you value your skills, whatever they are, and you have the courage to make 
different money decisions than everyone else, that is when I believe you can change the game for yourself. So let's talk about this a little bit. FOMO is such a real thing these days, especially on social media. And I know that I get trapped in this myself. So I would imagine that you do too. I mean, this is really the reason that social media is what it is, right? You see your friends and you see people that you don't even know who aren't actually your friends spending money and doing things that you want to do, right? Or things that you think maybe might make you look important or feel good or whatever it is, right? For a lot of us, we spend money because we want to feel something in life, right? Like our our lives have become dull, they've become numb, they've become just fear-ridden, anxiety-driven, stressful. You fill in any of those words, right? For most of us, we just want to feel something opposite of that. And there are so many different studies that we can dive into, but the studies have shown that a lot of us spend money because we're trying to feel good. We're trying to feel something. We're trying to put on a new shirt or pants or Jordan sneaks or whatever it is, feel something different, right? To to just, I don't know, maybe it's to feel alive. I've been sort of searching for this for quite some time. You know, why do we do what we do? Why do we spend money the way we spend money? And I'm including myself definitely in this bucket. And then when we do, sometimes we get back in that like money anxiety spiral and loop because we've made a decision that gets in the way of our money goals or that takes us further in debt or takes us further off track or just doesn't feel good to us. Like, why do we do this? And the only answer that I can come up with is that we're just trying to feel something (laughs) and we're just trying to feel something good. And sometimes buying something just makes you feel really good. And there's nothing inherently wrong with that. In fact, I'm your biggest advocate of sometimes just buying things because you got to just feel good or you got to feel an emotion other than fear, stress, anxiety, depression, fill in the blank with whatever that is for you. But something I have been striving for, for some time, and maybe you can borrow this if it feels good to you, is striving for this peak that I call authentically money. So it's this idea of saving and spending money with intention. The big word is intention, right? In a way that lines up with my values and my goals and doing so in a way that I I essentially put blinders on and kind of close my eyes to what everyone else is doing. So my goal has always been to reach this authentically money place 80% of the time and to give myself 20% grace to just totally F up and (laughs) spend money on stuff that I know I don't really need because we just want to feel better, (laughs) right? So I'm aiming for like 80% of the time, 80% can I spend and save my money in a way that feels authentic to me, who I am and how I want to show up in the world. The other 20% of messing up, of effing up, I'm totally okay with because I believe that perfection with money or really anything in life is completely overrated. And so if you are striving for perfection, you are probably stressing yourself out even more. And this comes from a fellow perfectionist. You are speaking directly to her right now. I had to let go of this idea and give myself room to just make some maybe decisions with my money that maybe you wouldn't make. Uh, Maybe I wouldn't make if I felt better in certain circumstances. I don't know, whatever it is. The idea is to just give yourself a little bit of grace there. So, you know, also in my my career, I'm just, I'm always challenging myself to to charge what I'm worth, whether it's speaking gigs or sponsorships or courses or workshops or working one-on-one with someone, it doesn't matter what it is, right? Because I figure that if I don't value my worth and I don't value my skills, nobody else will. And I hope that's something that you can really just kind of let sink in for yourself. And I think that that is something that Dolores did amazingly well. She had absolutely 
no clue how this was going to work out when she demanded a certain percentage of revenue for each shoe that was sold under the Air Jordan name. She had absolutely no idea how this was going to work out. There was no model before for her to follow, right? But she just had this idea that Michael was special, just like you're special, and you might not be able to get on a basketball court and do anything like Michael Jordan has done, right? But you are special in what you do. You are special in who you are. And so I love this, I don't know, there's this moral of, of trying to be authentic with your money, trying to save and spend it in a way that aligns up with your values. But then also the same regard saying like, hey, I'm worth something. Hey, I'm worth whatever that number is, right? Whether it's it's your career, whether it's a, a relationship in your life, whatever that is in your life that feels right for you, right? You're worth the best. And sometimes the best means you've got to stand up and you've got to actually advocate for yourself. Have you ever wondered what it's like to be buried in an avalanche? Weird foreign feeling of despair. Or how it feels to crash a skydive? I remember hearing a thud, feeling my body hit the ground. Or how you would react if you were being attacked by an alligator? At the end of my leg is this huge alligator head on my leg. These are the stories you'll hear on the podcast called What Was That Like? True stories told by the actual person who went through it. You'll hear from a victim of an attack. Dragging me into the bathroom and saying, I'm going to kill you, now you're going to die. You'll hear from a man who discovered a baby. How could this be? How could there be a baby on the ground? And you'll hear actual 911 calls. Clanky County 911, there's a man at my back door. He's trying to get in. What Was That Like is a podcast about real people in unreal situations. Search for What Was That Like on any podcast app or at What Was That Like. Com. Hi, I'm Karina Bemisterfer, host of Morning Cup of Murder, your daily true crime podcast. Yes, you heard me right. Daily true crime. Every day, Morning Cup of Murder tells you a straightforward, short form story about murder, true crime, cold cases, disappearances, serial killers, cults, and more. And I do that all in under 15 minutes. With over three years of stories and over 20 million downloads, the Morning Cup of Murder podcast has become a staple of so many people's daily routines. So why not add it to yours? Stream Morning Cup of Murder everywhere you listen to podcasts. And remember, stay safe. Want to know the number one money question I'm asked? It's how to get started investing without being overwhelmed. So if you're asking yourself the same question, then you have to check out the Investing for Beginners podcast. The host, Dave and Andrew, they break down investment terms and strategies in a way you can finally understand. I love that they're making investing accessible and they have an entire podcast dedicated to helping you invest better. Even if you're not ready to start investing, they explain the stock market and financial updates so you can really understand what is being said on the news. If you're ready to learn more about investing, I'd recommend you start with two of my favorite episodes. Listener Q&A, how do you start investing with a thousand bucks, where they explain how you get started right away, and back to basics of building your portfolio, where they explain how to build a portfolio from scratch. The Investing for Beginners podcast is a great way to start expanding your relationship with money. Find Investing for Beginners podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. All right, so you get the story here, right? Dolores had the guts to see beyond what everyone said was possible. And there's a lot of things that you can apply in your own life from those lessons from Dolores. So maybe you've wanted to start a business or you want to change careers or you want to, I don't know, start charging for those killer chocolates that you make at home that everyone says are amazing, but you just give away to people. Or maybe start a new department at work that could drive more customers and more money to your company. Or maybe say just like F it and you decide to move abroad and do something different when you're in your 30s or your 40s. Or maybe you do what one of my really good friends did. You take money out of your retirement account, which everyone says is a 
big no-no, but in this case, you use it to pay for studio time to record your album and get it out in the world and make yourself known, right? There are so many different things that we do with our money that other people might think are crazy. Like that is an absolutely crazy idea. Why would you take money out of your retirement accounts to record your album? Well, you do it because that's what you're passionate about and because it's your life and because you are not fixed to the rules of money or career or how things are done. You decide to take a different path. You decide to ask for more, whatever you want to call it, right? Maybe it feels like the lifesaver move for you to do at that time. That is a Dolores Jordan moment, I believe, right? Because you're stepping out and you're saying, I want to do something different for my life. I want to ask for something different. And I don't know if it can be done or not done. I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing. I don't know how it's going to work out, but I'm going to honor myself. I'm going to honor my talents and I'm going to honor my life and I'm going to decide to take a risk. So then we've got the part about passive income. Passive income is so super sexy. We've had so many guests on this show talk about building passive income, whether it's from courses and workshops or real estate. Real estate is probably the most commonly known way to build passive income. And even though things are a little bit different now, we're in a different housing market, the Airbnb market is completely different than it was a couple of years ago. There's still ways that you can earn passive income from real estate. But what I love about passive income, and I think this is definitely what Dolores Jordan saw, was that you have the ability with passive income to build more money buckets for yourself. So most of us just have one money bucket. That is the amount of money we earn from our career or our job. And there's nothing wrong with that one money bucket. But I believe that everything in this world kind of operates on cash flow. And so the more cash flow you can get, the more options you have in life, right? The more things that you can do with your money. So I like this idea of thinking about passive income. Maybe what can you bring in? Now, of course, it'd be brilliant if you could bring in $400 million a year from a shoe deal, but let's be realistic. We aren't all in that bucket, right? But what can you do, right? There, there's investing. So are you investing in uh, retirement accounts? Are you investing you know, outside of your retirement vehicles? We have so many guests on this show that have talked about building passive income from uh, investing. One of the best guests, Terry Ijeoma, if you've not listened to that episode, I will link it in the show notes. She teaches people how to earn passive income, cash flow, if you will, from uh, investing in something she calls swing trading. Not for everybody, but certainly, you know, something to think about. Of course, we have real estate, we have buying real estate, we have Airbnb models, you could, uh, you know, buy a, a duplex or a fourplex, live in one unit, rent out the other units, and it starts paying for your mortgage. There's real estate syndications. There's so many different ways you could do this. We've had a lot of guests on the show that have talked about real estate and how to create passive income. You could start a business. You could start a side hustle. There are lots of different ways, but even building just a small little extra money bucket of some passive income could go a long way, right? Because then it's what do you do with the passive income? Well, you could supercharge paying off your debt. You could save towards a big money goal. You could invest in your business. You can invest in more things that create even more passive income. And then we're creating even more money buckets of cash flow, right? So, you know, I would use the, the Dolores model not as an example of I'm never going to be able to do something like that because I'm not Michael Jordan. But what can you do? What can you do with the amount of money that you have right now? How can you turn that into more buckets of money? So also what I love about Dolores is that everybody said no to her. Everybody said this was not possible. And she was like, nope, yep, it's possible. It's going to happen. Somebody's going to make it happen. And I don't know, I have a little sneaky suspicion that she kind of knew the spot that Nike was in. She kind of was aware that 
things maybe weren't going so well over at Nike and maybe they were willing to kind of roll the dice a little bit. So I'm hoping, I don't know exactly how that part of the story went, but I'm hoping she also did her research, which just is an, another thing for you to really think about is, is, is doing your research, specifically if you're in your career and you're asking for a raise or you've got offered a new job and you're trying to negotiate a better salary, like do some research, right? Have some, have some stats, some information there with you, right? That really helps support while you're, why you're asking for the amount of money you're asking. But I love this that she wasn't just okay with playing by the rules. I think that's a really tangible lesson, maybe the biggest money lesson that you can take away from Dolores. You know, one of my key foundational principles about money is that there aren't any rules, really. The beauty is you don't have to do things in a certain order. And I was thinking about this because uh, my husband Jeff came to me the other day and I'm writing a book and I'm super excited to share that book with you eventually when it comes out. But I'm writing a book and I'm thinking about like, what are my money principles? What are my money rules? Because everybody always has a system or rules. And I was like, you know, I think <laughs> probably my my top money rule is that there actually aren't any money rules, which may be why I really love the Dolores Jordan story. I love that you can decide the sequence of your life. You can decide your money goals and your money achievements, and they don't have to line up with everybody else's. You don't have to go to college and then graduate and get a job and climb the corporate ladder and then get married and then buy a house and then have a kid. And then, I mean, you don't have to do everything in that order. And I wish you felt more of a, I don't know, like a permission slip from life that you could shake things up, that you could do things differently. And you also don't have to justify to anybody what you're going to do with your money, what you are doing with your money, right? You don't owe anybody an explanation, except to maybe somebody who's like accountable to you, <laughs> like a partner or a family member or something like that. You definitely, you definitely owe a little conversation to them. But anybody else, they're going to throw their judgments at you because that's what we do with money and it's ridiculous, but here we are. And so let's work within the system, right? The beauty is that you don't have to justify anything to anybody. And if somebody has something they want to say to you, just say, well, you know, I listened to this this chick, Shauna, on her podcast, Everyone's Talking Money, and she tells me that I don't have to do things in a certain order, that there aren't actual rules, and that I get to decide what I want to do with my money. So I'm just going to hang my hat on that principle. And I'm okay with that, right? And I also think that while there might not be rules... I do agree there are some guiding principles. And so here are actually my seven money principles that I think you could tattoo somewhere. And something tells me that Dolores might also be okay with these money principles. There's seven of them. Okay, are you ready? So number one is you got to earn more than you spend. I mean, it makes sense, right? It's hard to do sometimes. Just aim for doing your best. And always look for more buckets of money you can earn beyond your job, right? This comes back to the passive income piece. Number two is, I don't want you to worry about making money mistakes. We all make mistakes, but they're almost always recoverable. And granted, I've probably made a lot of the same money mistakes that you have made. You've probably made a lot of the money mistakes that your best friend had made, and so on, and so on, and so on, and so on, right? So I don't want you to stay stuck in making money mistakes or being worried about making a money mistake. Number three, Dolores would definitely advocate this one, know your worth, and please do not be afraid to ask for it. Negotiate higher than you think is possible. Ask for that big number. Pause. Don't apologize for it, right? Stand firm in it. Number four, I believe that making more money means you can help more people. Flat out believe it. It doesn't mean you have to be greedy. It doesn't mean being wealthy is a bad thing. What you do with your money is a powerful statement of who you are, right? Number five, with time, intention, and action, 
you can achieve almost any money goal. I don't care how much money you make. If we combine those three things, we can get you to money goals. Number six, don't underestimate the role your thoughts and feelings play in how you spend and save your money, right? Which takes me back to point number five, that word intention, right? So if we bring in some intention to how we spend and save our money, things really start to change, right? Two of the two of the most impactful questions you can ask yourself over and over and over again is what am I thinking? What am I thinking about my debt? What am I thinking about my money goals? What am I thinking about what I want to achieve, right? What am I really thinking about it? What are the thoughts behind it? Am I telling myself I can do it or I'm telling myself I can't do it, right? Second question is how do those thoughts make me feel? Most of us say they make us feel bad, unworthy, like we can't achieve something, right? And so when we think and feel in a negative way, our actions are not going to line up with a way that moves us towards being able to achieve our money goal. So can we work with what we're thinking? Can we work with how we feel? Can we change the narrative? Can we say, hey, there's never been a deal like this before, but I'm going to ask for it, right? And I'm going to take action. I'm going to practice every day. I'm going to get good at my skills. You fill in the blank, right? What works for you? And number seven, debt sucks, but it doesn't make you a bad person. So do your best to pay off what you can when you can. Then circle back to number five and number six, bringing some an intention in, thinking about how you're thinking and feeling about things. So I, I, I think Dolores might agree with my money principles. If you haven't seen the movie Air or you don't know the story, I promise if you see the movie, I have not spoiled it all for you. <laughs> Maybe a little bit, but it will still inspire you. Because as with everything about money and life, you got to take what works for you and you got to throw out the rest. Change with money, I believe, isn't about getting a huge shoe deal like Michael, right? We're not all going to be in that league. That helps, of course. I'm not going to deny the fact that more money helps. But change comes from understanding how you think and feel about money. And then what motivates you to take action and create some long lasting habits around money? That's the work, my friend. That's it, right? So I'll ask you, you know, what's your Dolores Jordan moment for today? What's one small thing you can do that's going to make a big impact on your money going forward? It could be something as simple as checking your account balance or calling your credit card company to request a lower interest rate, or it could be creating the first sentence to your business plan, or maybe putting that extra 50 bucks or 100 bucks or whatever it is in your investment account that's just extra money kind of sitting in your bank account. It could be looking back at your spending the last week and saying, ah, are there any tweaks and changes I need to take so I can start being more intentional with my money? Right? There are lots of different kind of small steps you can take. They don't all have to be big sweeping, big sweeping changes. But I just want you to come back to this idea of Dolores Jordan and this moment when she decided she wanted to try to do things differently. So whatever you're stuck in right now, whatever big emotion you feel about money or frustration or whatever goal you're trying to get to and you just can't seem to make it work, right? Maybe try to look at it from a different perspective and see if you can bring a little bit of that Dolores Jordan magic in there. If you enjoyed this episode, do me a favor, share it with a friend, family member, somebody you know, you know, might need a little extra motivation around money. And as always, you can head to the show notes for everything that I kind of mentioned in this episode, as well as our sponsors who make this show possible. And I will see you back here, my friend, for a brand new episode in just a few days. 